received a dispatch from Seoul advising that the North Koreans have struck in great strength south across the 38th parallel at 4 o'clock this morning. MacArthur was routed out of bed by an urgent tone of voice exactly as that early Sunday morning nine years ago. As if to wake from one nightmare to another, the enemy's sudden devastating blow struck. Not again. MacArthur told himself. Ten divisions of the North Korean armed forces, backed by 1,600 heavy guns and 200 Soviet tanks, streamed across the 38th parallel into South Korean territory on that morning. The South Korean forces were quickly dispersed by the opening barrage and, in confusion, fled southward, abandoning their supplies and heavy equipment along the way. Complete collapse was imminent. Within the next 74 hours, the North Korean forces captured the South Korean capital Seoul, forcing the government to flee to Pusan. And it was estimated that within 10 days, the North Korean army would drive the South Korean army off of the Southern Cliff. It was too late to fight or resist. The only seeming task at hand was an immediate evacuation of all U.S. personnel out of the war zone. How could the United States have allowed such a deplorable situation to develop? Only a short time before, our country had been militarily more powerful than any nation on earth. But in the short space of five years, this power had been frittered away in a bankruptcy of positive and courageous leadership toward any long-range objectives. Again, I asked myself, what is United States policy in Asia? The South Koreans may themselves contain the attack. If, however, it appears that they cannot do so, then we believe that United States force should be used. To sit by while Korea is overrun by unprovoked armed attack would start a disastrous chain of events leading most probably to world war. For two years, since the establishment of the Republic of Korea in 1948, the State Department had deemed Korea outside the U.S. strategic interest. This policy kept an army of 100,000 South Koreans as a constabulary force, without tanks or heavy artillery, and with logistics of the chewing gum and baling wire variety. Despite the knowledge that 150,000 North Korean troops were armed to the teeth by the Russians. Exactly a week prior to the invasion, this policy of indifference was reversed. John Foster Dulles, as personal representative of Secretary of State Dean Acheson, visited Korea to give a speech at the National Assembly of the Republic of Korea. Korea, you are not alone, Dallas proclaimed, and promised full U.S. support. The wheel was already turning then, and it only awaited a necessary but foreseeable prompting such as a northern invasion 
for the policy of war to be carved in stone. MacArthur, Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers, was completely uninformed of this adverse change in U.S. policy. On June 27th, two days after North Korea's invasion, MacArthur and other high-ranking generals were summoned to a situation room of the Daiichi building. As the decoded message from President Truman was projected onto a panel screen, a deadly silence descended upon the room. I don't believe it, MacArthur broke the silence. He then turned to other generals for some plausible explanation only to find out they too were staring at the screen with open-jawed amazement. MacArthur's mind reeled. He could not believe it. Harry Truman, that equivocating politician whom he could face down whenever he chose, that Missouri hayseed accidentally shot into the White House by the death of a far greater man, a pusillanimous nobody so easy to intimidate that he had never done anything but hint that he wanted MacArthur to come home, unlike Roosevelt, who would have told him to come home and made it a direct order. That same Harry Truman, surrounded by a bunch of mealy-mouthed liberals, had somehow found the balls to fight? Perplexed and dismayed, MacArthur left the Situation Room. Within the next few hours, the UN Security Council promptly authorized urgent military measures to restore the security in the region, thus declaring the first UN war to protect the Republic of Korea a non-UN member. By that nightfall, American airstrikes against the North Korean Air Force began. MacArthur was to be named as the Commander-in-Chief of the UN operations in Korea in 10 days. I could not help being amazed at the manner in which this great decision was being made. With no submission to Congress, whose duty it is to declare war, and without even consulting the field commander involved, the members of the executive branch of the government agreed to enter the Korean War. I haven't seen you smoke that pipe, General, for years. On June 29th, MacArthur was on the plane to Suwon Airfield, 20 miles south of now failed capital Seoul, to inspect the situation for himself. Behind him was 50 years of service, including the most desperate campaigns as Bataan, Corregidor, New Guinea, and yet, a sense of distress overwhelmed him for a moment. MacArthur had almost involuntarily reached for his old, corn cup pipe. It was in this desperate moment, however, MacArthur conceived of a strategy to win. Merely driving the enemy back to 38th parallel is not enough. The reunification of Korea could only be achieved by a total annihilation of the enemy forces. But how could such a decisive victory be achieved at this late hour when Washington is unwilling to commit a large number of troops and thus we are outnumbered by the enemy almost three to one? An all-out frontal assault against superior forces would simply be suicide and mass, while a piecemeal approach wouldn't work either. The conundrum swelled through his mind. Looking at the map of the Far East, MacArthur pondered, since the surprise invasion, the North Korean commander drove his troops toward Pusan 
a southern port city to which the South Korean government fled. He was marching toward his victory, keeping a steady but cautious advance of six miles a day. Behind his great advance was, however, the prolonged supply and communication lines extended across the Korean peninsula. A potential began to take shape in MacArthur's mind as an idea of the double envelopment. Forming a pincer between the 8th Army at Pusan and the naval forces landing deep into the flank of the enemy forces south of Seoul. A bold counter-strike that will catch the enemy off guard. I'd land them here, at Incheon. A port city 200 miles northwest of Pusan and only 20 miles west of the capital city, Seoul. Incheon was located right at the heart of the enemy's territory. All the supply and communication lines of the enemy also converged upon the area around Incheon. This lifeline, if successfully cut, would mean a total annihilation of the Northern Army. To hell with business as usual. MacArthur told the Joint Chiefs who came to discuss the strategy. The first order of business was to slow down the northern troops so as to buy time for the 8th Army to build up the line of defense around Pusan and prepare the ground for the ultimate surprise. All this, however, had to be done without the adequate number of troops or a good commander. Walton H. Walker a 61-year-old, short, fat, hard-boiled Texan, was the commanding general of the 8th Army. Walker was no George Patton, under whom he served during the World War II, nor his predecessor, Robert Eichelberger, the legendary maker of the 8th Army. After the North Korean troops crossed the Han River, Walker's 8th Army continuously retreated to south, handing Tijuan over to the enemy on July 20th. On the next day, just when Walker was to withdraw further, MacArthur visited him and gave the aging old general a stand-or-die order. Completely emboldened by this, Walker issued a statement to his army the next day. There will be no Dunkirk, no Bataan. A retreat to Pusan would be one of the greatest butcheries in history. We must fight until the end. Capture by these people is worse than death itself. If some of us must die, we will die fighting together. Rather than committing these troops to a bloody frontal assault, however, MacArthur employed them for a strategy of deception. To fool the North Korean commander into a belief that he was surrounded by a massive number of American ground troops, harassment and deception of all tactics were employed, when in reality we were outnumbered more than 20 to 1 in some instances. Although major part of the 24th Division was completely crashed in this maneuver, precious time was bought to build up the defense line around Pusan. Having no means to know the actual strengths of American forces, the enemy commander ordered his troops to detour across the difficult terrain rather than taking a chance of driving his troops forward. The enemy's advance was thus slowed down significantly. And by the time the enemy commander realized that he was deceived by an arrogant appearance of force, it was too late. On August 4th, distrusting of MacArthur, Truman first sent his special envoy Avril Harriman to dissuade MacArthur from an amphibious landing at Incheon. Disgusted of Truman, MacArthur sent Harriman back with a message. 
tell the President that I will, on the rising tide of the 15th of September, land at Inchon, and between the hammer of this landing and the anvil of the 8th Army, I will crush and destroy the Army of North Korea. The meeting with Harriman itself, MacArthur later recounted, reinforced an impression in his mind that Washington is under a powerful foreign influences, especially those of Great Britain. Not just Washington, but virtually every single military general opposed to the Incheon landing. Thus, on August 23rd, a strategy conference was held at the Daiichi building in Tokyo. Army Chief of Staff General Joseph Collins, Chief of Naval Operation Forrest P. Sherman, Amphibious Expert Admiral T. Doyle, MacArthur's Chief of Staff Edward Almond, and other military officials were all packed into a small conference room of the Daiichi building. The probability of success is zero, the naval expert argued. The maximum tide range at Incheon was 33 feet, one of the greatest in the world. Given the tide and equinox, out of three days during the month of September when an amphibious landing could be attempted, there were only few hours of window to land 13,000 troops, tanks, and supplies. Tide and time imposed such a constraint on the plan that what was meant to be a surprise attack on Incheon had to be carried out in two separate phases with 12 hours of time lag in between. The first assault to take over Walmido Island, a honeycomb of harbor defenses, would occur during the morning high tide, and the second assault on Incheon upon the afternoon high tide. A slight variation in the calculation of tide and timing would mean the soldiers would be stuck in the mud flats far away from the landing beaches. Moreover, since there was no time but to land the soldiers and equipment, the first landing craft would be stuck in the mud at Walmido Island until the next tide 12 hours later, leaving itself completely exposed and the soldiers landed without any hope of reinforcements, even in the face of counterstrikes. If every possible geographical and naval handicap were listed, Incheon has them all, Admiral Sherman boasted. Besides the known difficulties, the unknown factor in the equation was too big, said the experts. Despite an initial estimate of Womido Island being a honeycomb of harbor defenses, daily aerial observations days prior to the attack contradicted this estimate and showed the enemy's defense line mostly unoccupied. The entire plan was based on an unfounded assumption, the statisticians of war argued, that the harbor was scarcely defended. If the bet were to fail, therefore, it would be a bloodbath. It was, as MacArthur himself admitted, a 5,000 to 1 gamble. Why not compromise. Following the Navy's argument, Army Chief of Staff General Collins presented a case for choosing Kunsan, a midpoint between Incheon and Pusan. Following the presentation, Admiral Sherman promptly weighed in favor of the Kunsan option. The case was clear. Incheon was not possible and had no support. As the silence sunk in, the tension in the room rose dramatically. For MacArthur, the silence hearkened back to a familiar voice of his father in the old days. The bulk of the Reds are committed around Walker's defense perimeter. The enemy, I am convinced, has failed to prepare Inchon properly for defense. The very arguments you have made as to the impracticability involved will tend to ensure for me the element of surprise. For the enemy commander will reason that no one would be so brash as to make such an attempt. 
surprise is the most vital element for success in war. The Navy's objections as to tides, hydrography, terrain, and physical handicaps are indeed substantial and pertinent, but they are not insuperable. My confidence in the Navy is complete, and in fact, I seem to have more confidence in the Navy than the Navy has in itself. As to the proposal for a landing at Kunsan, it would indeed eliminate many of the hazards of Incheon, but it would be largely ineffective and indecisive. It would be an attempted envelopment which would not envelop. If my estimate is inaccurate, and should I run into a defense with which I cannot cope, I will be there personally and will immediately withdraw our forces before they are committed to a bloody setback. The only loss, then, will be my professional reputation. But Inchon will not fail. Inchon will succeed. And it will save 100,000 lives. A week later, on August 29th, a wire came from the Joint Chief of Staff. In making preparations and executing a turning movement by amphibious forces on the west coast of Korea at Incheon. On the high tide of the morning of September 15th, a force of marines seized the small island of Walmido. Upon the afternoon tide, two separate regiments successfully landed on Incheon through red and blue beaches, landing 13,000 marines ashore together with all their heavy weapons and equipment. Completely ignoring General Shepard's player to stop him, MacArthur rushed his way to the front line of the battle. Even with the heavy exchange of fire continuing, it was already clear that the landing of Incheon had succeeded exactly as MacArthur foresaw. The harbor around Incheon showed evidence of fortification underway. Nonetheless, more rapid defense buildup was taking place at Kunsan, where the enemy stipulated to be the most likely target. In less than two weeks, the capital Seoul was liberated and soon returned to the government of the Republic of Korea, while the enemy's communication and supply lines were cut. Within a month, a perfect pincer forged by the troops landed at Incheon and Walker's 8th Army at Pusan captured 130,000 northern troops. Combined with this pincer movement was a strict border control by Yuan troops along the 38th parallel that eliminated any possibility of enemy escaping to the north. It was a decisive victory upon which the two Koreas could once again be united. Nobody at this point, however, knew what was to come in less than seven months after the Incheon landing. At a prompting of the British Prime Minister Attlee, on April 11th, 1951, Truman, in the midst of war, fired MacArthur as a commander of UN forces in Korea. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, 
and distinguished members of the Congress, I stand on this rostrum with a sense of deep humility and great pride. Humility in the wake of those great American architects of our history who have stood here before me. Pride in the reflection that this forum of legislative debate represents human liberty in the purest form yet devised. Here are centered the hopes and aspirations and faith of the entire human race. I do not stand here as advocate for any partisan cause, for the issues are fundamental and reach quite beyond the realm of partisan consideration. They must be resolved on the highest plane of national interest if our course is to prove sound and our future protected. I trust, therefore, that you will do me the justice of receiving that which I have to say as solely expressing the considered viewpoint of a fellow American. I address you with neither rancor nor bitterness in the fading twilight of life with but one purpose in mind, to serve my country. <laughs> the issues are global and so interlocked that to consider the problems of one sector oblivious to those of another is but to court disaster for the whole. We could hold in Korea by constant maneuver and at an approximate area where our supply line advantages were in balance with the supply line disadvantages of the enemy. But we could hope at best for only an indecisive campaign with its terrible and constant attrition upon our forces if the enemy utilized his full military potential. I have constantly called for the new political decisions essential to a solution. Efforts have been made to distort my position. It has been said in effect that I was a warmonger. Nothing could be further from the truth. I know war as few other men now living know it, and nothing to me. And nothing to me is more revolting. I have long advocated its complete abolition, as its very destructiveness on both friend and foe has rendered it useless as a means of settling international disputes. Indeed, on the second day of September 1945, just following the surrender of the Japanese nation on the battleship Missouri, I formally cautioned as follows. Men, since the beginning of time, have sought peace. Various methods through the ages have been attempted to devise an international process to prevent or settle disputes between nations. From the very start, workable methods were found insofar as individual citizens were concerned. But the mechanics of an instrumentality of larger international scope have never been successful. Military alliances, balances of power, 
the leagues of nations all in turn failed, leaving the only path to be by way of the crucible of war. The utter destructiveness of, destructiveness of war now blots out this alternative. We have had our last chance. If we will not devise some greater and more equitable system, Armageddon will be at our door. The problem basically is theological and involves a spiritual recrudescent and improvement of human character that will synchronize with our almost matchless advances in science, art, literature, and all material and cultural developments of the past 2,000 years. It must be of the spirit if we are to save the flesh. But once war is forced upon us, there is no other alternative than to apply every available means to bring it to a swift end. War's very object is victory, not prolonged indecision. In war, there is no substitute for victory. I have just left your fighting sons in Korea. They have met all tests there, and I can report to you without reservation they are splendid in every way. It was my constant effort to preserve them and end this savage conflict honorably and with the least loss of time and a minimum sacrifice of life. Its growing bloodshed has caused me the deepest anguish and anxiety. Those gallant men will remain often in my thoughts and in my prayers, always. I am closing my 52 years of military service. When I joined the Army, even before the turn of the century, it was the fulfillment of all my boyish hopes and dreams. The world has turned over many times since I took the oath on the plane at West Point, and the hopes and dreams have long since vanished. But I still remember the refrain of one of the most popular barrack ballads of that day, which proclaimed most proudly that old soldiers never die. They just fade away. And like the old soldier of that ballad, I now close my military career and just fade away. An old soldier who tried to do his duty as God gave him the light to see that duty. Goodbye.
shakes hands with Speaker Sam Rayburn, Vice President Parker, exchanges a few words with him.